Hello, folks. I hope you are doing very well and keeping safe. You are welcome to Constitutional Law Pass 307. I'm very excited to be here and to be your tutor. It is my honest hope that you all enjoy the course as I would want it to be. Now, let's zoom straight into action. Now, as a way of ground rules, I would expect all students to read beforehand. Now, the essence of this whole program is for students to have materials beforehand. So I believe that every discussion I am having here, students already have the materials and can follow. And hopefully some may have even read beforehand. Now, I expect that students would first and foremost read, go online, find books, do a research, know more about the course so that the discussions I have here would just reinforce whatever they have already learned. Now, due to the nature of the semester, it would need the cooperation of students and then tutors to have a successful semester. Now, I for one believe constitutional law is one of the most important courses under public administration. This is because the whole essence of public administration, in my view, revolves around the constitution of the state. That whatever happens with the constitution and respect of the governance also goes to affect the public administration in that the day-to-day -day management of the states and the policies being churned out are all affected by the constitution of the state. Now for session one, our whole purpose is to try to understand the constitution as have been in the past, as is presently being seen and, ho and hopefully how it would be in the future. We believe that the constitutional law as happened in the past had and is still having an effect on the constitution as we are having now and would possibly do same in the future. And indeed, most of the provisions we have in the constitution are based on precedents or are based on factual situations that happened in the past that you know, caused the framers of the constitution, you know, to um, draft it in such a way so as to meet the needs of that time. And possibly going on into the future, the present constitution we have now, which is the 1992 constitution, would definitely be amended one way or the other to meet the, the, the current needs of the society. Now, we will start by trying to look at constitutional law as existed before the incoming of the whites during their stay in the Gold Coast and even after they left us. So we'll be dealing with the pre-colonial era, the colonial era and the post-colonial era. Now, even before we get into it, for the pre-colonial era, as I, I said, of course, Every state has a constitution. Every community has a constitution. Now, as we go on, you would understand that when I use the word constitution, I don't use it to mean a particular document. As you go on, you would understand that the word constitution could mean the usages, the conventions, the practices, the rules, the bylaws that are applicable in every state, which means that even before the coming of the British and you know, other countries, our old folks had a way of managing themselves. The chiefs and the, and the fetish priests and the elders had a way of managing themselves. That system of governance as they had is what is termed as the pre-colonial era. So we are trying to understand the constitutional arrangement as had existed at the pre or before the coming of the colonial masters. We we'll then move on to understand how the constitutional arrangement was when our colonial masters settled in and how they sought to you know, manage the Gold Coast, not just the Gold Coast, which became Ghana, 
but even uh, Lagos, Sierra Leone, you know, and, and other colonies as they governed. Now for the post-colonial era or for the post-constitutional arrangements, we are trying to understand how the Gold Coast managed to govern itself after the colonial masters had left the shores of the newborn country. I mean, how was the arrangement, like how was the executive, the legislature and the judiciary functioning after our colonial masters left? Now here, we are looking at it in the light of both the civilian and the military regimes. Now, when we talk about civilian re regimes, we are talking about the time where the administration of the country was done by the, the election of a president. I mean, essentially, and when we talk about the military regimes, we are talking about the time where the governance of the state were in the arms of the armed forces, you know, the soldiers and then the, the military government. And you would know that for, for Ghana, we've, we've had a few, you know, coup, uh, coup d'etats and we've had a few military, you know, regimes taking over the, the country. Of course, all that have shaped the constitution as we have now. And, and whether good or bad, it has formed the constitution as it's now at play now. And the current circumstances as we have now will definitely shape future constitutions. So you would understand that it is so important for us to understand and appreciate the past so that we know how to um, restructure the future going forward. Now, under this, we'll be looking at the pre-colonial era. I've mentioned it. We'll be looking at the colonial era. We'll, we'll look at the independent Ghana. Independent Ghana means that when um, Ghana gained independent and, and was free from the colonial masters. Of course, independent Ghana at that time did not necessarily mean that we were out of the clutches of our colonial masters. Of course, they still exerted uh, a bit of control on us. We really became free under the Republic regime, which here would be the first regime. And immediately after the first regime, we had our first no, a military takeover, which was done by the National Liberation Council. Then we had um, the Second Republic, then another military takeover by the National Redemption Council. Then we had the Supreme Military Council, one and two. And then there came the Armed Forces Revolution, then the Third Republic and the Provisional National Defense Council, which we all know as the PNDC, a very popular one. Then the Fourth Republic, so for those who don't know, as of now, we are still in the Fourth Republic. The Fourth Republic started or began in 1992, but officially in uh, 93. And as of now, we are still in the Fourth Republic. Hopefully, that will be the case. Hopefully, that will be the case. But we cannot tell. But um, it is my honest hope that we will be in the, in the four, Fourth Republic. But and only, only posterity can tell. Now to begin, now as I already stated, the current constitution only tells us what happened in the past. And as we will go on, you would know that there are certain provisions which are entrenched, entrenched in the sense that they cannot be amended easily. And those provisions were fixed there because of some past happenings. So you would understand that even the constitution we have now, if we are to dissect it very well, we will see that it is based on the failings of past constitutions that you know, informed the, uh, the drafters of the constitution to put in certain clauses that would be beneficial to us and meet the current needs. Definitely going into the future, and there may be new happenings which would require um, amendments into our, our constitution. So it is so very, very important that we understand the history of Ghana in respect of the constitution that have been at play and how they have affected the current constitution. Now to begin, the current Ghana as we have now is actually a patched up of four colonies. So um, 
Ghana, in essence, is not really or has never been one. If, if I, I should put it in an, another language, it was our colonial masters after colonizing you know, the few um, territories around them decided to put Ghana together. So the Ghana that we all have or that we all know is made up of four different territories. Now, if I'm to go into this, originally when the colonial masters came, they settled at the Gold Coast. And I'm sure most of us are aware of this. We, we, we studied this in our social studies and in whatnot. But um, when our colonial masters came, they settled at the Gold Coast. So for Gold Coast, it was, it was Gold Coast was colonized by way of settlement. Now, initially, of course, they came in as merchants. And as we would go on, you understand that when they came in as merchants and then they started you know, trading with the, the dwellers of the Gold Coast, as in those who lived around the Gold Coast, Cape Coast, Accra, and whatnot, they felt that, well, um, Gold Coast, or, which, or Ghana, as we have now, was a very rich country. So they decided to you know, explore more. And then they went ahead, they brought in you know, a few of their merchants and a few of their governors who came in and then came in the famous bond of 1844, which we all say that it was at that point that they took over the Gold Coast, even though as we would learn going forward, the whole essence of um, the bond of 1844 was not to arrogate power into the hands of, of of our colonial masters, but it appeared that through the bond of 1844, and they gained total domination over the Gold Coast and then they took over. Now for the Ashanti, it was through war. I mean, for the, for the many wars that they had with the Ashantis, um, they, for one, they won and it was out of it that um, the Ashanti kingdom as it was, became part of Ghana. So if for those who, who may be writing and for those who need, who would want me to repeat, I'm saying that for the Gold Coast, it was by settlement. Our colonial masters took over the Gold Coast by settlement. For the Ashanti kingdom, it was by through conquest or by wars. Normally we say through conquest. So they conquered the Ashanti region and they made Ashanti region as part of the Gold Coast colony, and this was in 1901. Now for the Northern Territories, for the Northern Territories, normally it was, or we say that it was through a protectorate. Protectorate means that as at that time, the Northern Territories, and essentially when we are talking about those at the Northern part of Ghana, as we have now, now they needed protection from those up of them. So um, the only way they, they could get that protection was for them to accede power to the colonial matters or to the British. So the agreement then was that um, we would only protect you from your enemies or from your neighboring towns if you would allow us rule over you. And that is how um, the northern part of Ghana became part of the Gold Coast. So if I'm repeating, for the Gold Coast, it was by settlement. For the Ashanti, it was by a conquest. For the Northern Territories, it was by protectorate or by protection, by way of protection. Now, then we have what we call the Togo or the Trans-Togoland. Now, the Trans-Togoland back then really was made up of part of the Volta region and then Togo. Now, what happened was that it was actually being managed by the British and then the Germans. So um, up until 1954, we had what we call the plebiscite. The, the plebiscite essentially was a yes or no vote. So in that yes or no vote, um, the folks around part of the Volta region and Togo were asked whether they were going to be part of the new country being formed, which was Ghana, or they, were, they would want to remain in where they are, which was Togo. And part of them decided to be part of the new country called Ghana and they formed um, the Volta region and now the OT region. And then a part of those who said, no, we still want to be where we are. They formed um, Togo as we have now. So that really is the 
Togoland trusteeship, what actually happened was that um, as at that time, or even before the plebiscite was held, um, the UK government or British were actually more like managing that bit uh, between the voter region and Togo for UN. So UN was actually in charge of this and then um, Britain and Germany and a few other countries were managing them. So as at the time they were living, they needed to hand these you know, places over. And that is when the plebiscite came in and there was this yes or no vote as I said earlier. And those who agreed to be part of the new country really formed um, the voter region and now the OT and those who decided not to be part of Ghana joined Togo. I mean, that is why you would normally hear that, you know, most of the folks in the voter region and OT and whatnot, most of them have, you know, relatives and ancestors in Togo. I mean, I mean, this is, uh, this is the genesis of it because at a point in time, they were actually one. They were actually one. And then they had to decide whether they'll be part of Ghana or they'll be part of Togo. So it is not you know, surprising that normally you hear that you know, some folks, they have their relatives you know, from Ghana, even though they, that person may be a Togolese or maybe a Ghanaian, but, you know, has a relative in Togo and whatnot. I mean, that is, I mean, that was the beginning of, of that. So for those who agreed, became part of Ghana, and for those who didn't, join Togo. So that is how Ghana was formed. It started with the Gold Coast and a settlement, then it came with a um, conquest with the addition of the Ashanti kingdom. Then those in the North required protection. So they were added. Then those within the um, trans land between Volta region and then Togo had to decide whether they would be part of the new country that was being formed or they would be part of Togo. And that is how um, Ghana was formed. So you would understand that because of the nature of how Ghana was formed, it is not too surprising that, you know, um, even as of now, over 60 years, we still have these um, divisions and whatnot because um, those lines are still there. Even though we've been patched up as one, the lines appear to be so very, very clear. And of course, I would not want to go um, into that, but I mean, that is how Ghana is. So the whole essence of this, let me try and re-emphasize the point here. The whole essence of you understanding this point is that assuming a government is formulating laws, having in its mind how the country was formed, it is imperative that the laws are formed to meet the needs of each of these territories. Meaning that the provisions that ought to be made to those at the Ashanti or yes, should, should be tailored to their needs. Those of the North should be tailored to their needs, those in the South and even those, you know, along Volta or T as, we, as we, we have now. Because if we are not very careful and we decide that, well, what is given to the Ashantis and should be the same going up North, may really have issues. So an understanding of this, even as a government, if you have a very good understanding of this, when you are making certain statements, you are, mind, you are mindful because you know that even the formation of the country, I mean, underwent you know, certain processes and we were patched together as one. So this is very, very important. This is very important. And I, I hope you, you understand it. Um, if you do not understand, you can always send me um, a question and then I will do well to clarify that point for you. Now during the colonial, no, the pre-colonial era, it was mostly done by the chiefs. Now the executive, the executive I should explain, really when we talk about the executive, we are talking about the body that is in charge of the day-to-day -day governing of the state. Okay. okay. We are talking about the body that is in charge of the day-to-day -day management of the state. So. At the pre-colonial era, it was done by the chiefs. The executive power as at that time was manned by the chiefs, the elders, uh, the Asafu, which was the body of the youth and, and the armies and, and 
and all other folks that you know were, were deemed as, as relevant as at that time. So the chiefs or the chief acted as the what really would be the, the chief executive officer, and I mean in a, a normal a company setting. So the chief was in charge of the day-to-day -day management of the community. But of course, this was done with the support of the elders. I mean, the, the youth, those in charge of the youth and even the army. So they helped in the day-to-day -day running of the community. When we come to the legislature, we are talking about how laws are made. Same as the pre-colonial era, the chiefs were very, very predominant in the making of laws or in ensuring that uh, laws are made to govern the, the community that they found themselves. So here, it was still done by the chiefs, the elders, and, and the representatives of the, of the major tribes as it existed back then. So where laws would be made, well, proposals would be sent, and the chief would hold a meeting, inviting the elders and then the, re the reps of all these major tribes for them to determine whether uh, that particular law by law or customary law um, should be binding on the folks in that uh, community. So then again, the executive was done by the chief, the elders and um, the body of youth and the army. The legislature was essentially done by this same group that is the chief, the elders and the reps of the major tribes. They made the customary law of that community. And you have to understand that the customary law of Ghana differ from one community to the other, meaning that you cannot um, assume that the customary law as would exist among the, the Ga Adangbis will be the same for the Ashantis or for the Krobos and whatnot. No, the customary law as existed back then, or even now, it is different from one society to the other or one community to the other. And these laws were made by the chiefs the elders and the reps of the major tribes. Now for the judiciary, the judiciary is really in charge of interpreting the laws as have been made by the legislature. So if I can throw more light on this, the laws are made by the legislature. It is being implemented by the executives and the interpretation is done by the judiciary. So when it came to the interpretation of the customary laws that were made, when it came to the interpretation of the bylaws that were made, those were done by the chief, the elders with the family heads. They served as, um, the family heads served as, as the lawyers back then. And then the chiefs with the elders you know, served as uh, the judges and then and the panel. So assuming uh, um, a member had committed an offense or had committed an act that amounted to a breach of a customary law, it would be the family head who would want to you know, intercede for that member and the chief and the elders would determine what the appropriate sanction would be. So that is how the pre-colonial era was. The executive, which is the day-to-day -day activity of the community or the administration of the laws or the implementation of the laws was done by the chiefs with the elders and the Asafu groups and even the body of youth they were in charge of the day-to-day -day management of the, society, of the society. When it came to the legislature, when it came to the making up of laws, it was done by the chiefs, the elders, and the reps of the major tribes. When it came to the interpretation and even at times the enforcement of some of the laws, of course, the interpretation would lead to the, uh, the court in court um, enforcing you know, some of the laws, but the real enforcement is actually done by the executive. This was done by the chiefs, the elders, and then um, the family heads who served as lawyers. So I hope um, um, this point is also clear. So that was the state or the constitutional architecture of the pre-colonial era. Now, when it came to the colonial era here, we are looking at the, at the time when um, the, our colonial masters were at our shores and had already begun in a, you know, them taking over affairs. Now, even before 1821, settlers from Britain were already in the, uh, in the Gold Coast, I won't say country, 
in the Gold Coast as at that time. And these guys were mostly merchants. They were just here to trade, trade for gold, you know, trade for you know, other stuff. But when they came and then they realized, well, we can do more just than trading. They started what has normally been called as an illegal administration of the Gold Coast back then. Because uh, most of the folks around that time realized that the laws that were being used among the merchants were more efficient than what was being applied by the chiefs in that among the chieftaincy system and, uh, and among the judiciary system, as it was with respect of the chiefs, you know, folks could manage their way by, you know, bribing others and then, you know, um, and most of the judgments from the chiefs were not, were, were not very pleasing to the, to the people. So most of them started taking their issues to the merchants because they realized that the system of laws these guys were using were better than that of the chiefs. So that was how they started administering the British rule in the Gold Coast. Now, at a point in time, the chiefs at the Gold Coast were not very happy because of course, I mean, they, they were losing out because almost all the problems that could you know, bring them or that could fetch them money uh, were being done by the, the merchants and their system of law. So they petitioned the queen in the UK and it was through that that they agreed that a bond should be signed. And that led to what we call the bond of 1844, which was signed um, on the 6th of March. Indeed, the bond of 1844 was not, or the purpose of it was not for the Gold Coast to arrogate its authority to the British, no. The whole idea was for them to be a regularity between um, the system of justice that was being administered by the chiefs and also by the merchants. So in the bond of 1844, and the chiefs agreed that they were going to uh, stop what we call panarin. Panarin, that is panarin, essentially meant that um, where a person had committed an offense, he or she could be sold into slavery. So as part of the provisions in the bond of 1844, they were supposed to stop panarin, which is the uh, selling of, 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 of slaves. And normally these slaves were guys who had committed one or two offenses. Another provision in the bond of 1844 was to avoid human sacrifice and other barbaric acts that was being committed around that time. Now, another idea in the bond of 1844, as I said, was to regularize the, you know, the justice system. So the chiefs were now uh, you know, allowed to you know, use the justice system as was being applied by the British because of course, most of the inhabitants in the Gold Coast realized that the justice system that was being used by the British settlers were more fair than what was being applied by the chiefs. So in a, in a sense, the whole idea of the bond of 1844 was to bring peace, was to ensure that there is a peaceful coexistence between um, the chiefs with its people and then the British merchants who had come to the Gold Coast. But um, as we all know, it turned out to be a, a point in history where the Gold Coast lost its authority to the British or the British uh, one way or the other managed to take over the control of the Gold Coast through the signing of the bond of 1844. I would advise students to um, read more uh, on the bond of 1844. Now, if after your readings you are having challenges or you don't really appreciate it, you can always send me a question and I will do uh, very well to explain it to you. So the bond of 1844 set the stage for the British administration in the Gold Coast. So it's, it's, it's a very pivotal point in our history as a country because it is after the bond of 1844 that we saw the influence of the Gold Coast being you know, exhibited at, at a very um, higher rate. So after the bond of 1844, I mean, there came in you know, certain governors to come and rule the Gold Coast on behalf of the Queen in UK. Now, as I said, the powers of the Queen. 
So even though we were under the governorship of the queen, the authority of the queen was always exercised by um, a governor. Now, during the colonial era, the executive power, that is the day-to-day -day management was vested in the crown. Here, yeah, the crown means the queen, was vested in the queen of UK, but the powers of the queen was um, exhibited or was exercised by the governor. So the governor had the powers to determine the day-to-day -day running of the Gold Coast as a data. Of course, I mean, as time went on with um, a few of the foes going to UK, the likes of, you know, Mensa Saba, Kwame Nkrumah, I mean, they, they came in and then they said that, well, the rulership was, was not fair to us and then they advocated for changes and whatnot. So, I mean, most of these changes came afterwards, but as at this time, it was the queen that had the powers and it was exercised by the governor. Now, when it, it came to the making of laws, it was still done by the queen, but also through the governor who was at that time in the Gold Coast. And it was the governor who was, you know, um, more of a sort making laws. Of course, for the major laws, they were made in UK and then they were, they were brought to the Gold Coast. But for the um, not so serious laws, what, what we call the delegated legislative powers, the not so very serious laws, the governor had the authority to make those laws for the Gold Coast. Now, when it came to the judiciary, when it came to the interpretation of the laws as had been made, that power was vested in the courts. So as at that time, there were courts in the Gold Coast. So the courts in the Gold Coast were the ones dealing with the interpretation and even the enforcement of these laws. Now, where there was an appeal, it went to the West African Court for Appeal, which was in a Sierra Leone. And the final adjudicating body was the Privy Council in UK. So if you were not satisfied with the decision of the court in, in the Gold Coast back then, you could go to the West African Court of Appeal. If you were not satisfied, then you would have to go to UK under the authority of the Privy Council. Now you can understand the challenges this came with because the Privy Council was in UK. So assuming you had a, a matter, and here we are, we are talking about um, around the 19, no, even the 1870s up to the 1900s, I mean, where the means of uh, transportation was not as flexible as we have now. So assuming you have a matter and you are dissatisfied with the judgment of the West African Court of Appeal, it meant that you had to travel to UK for your matter to be heard. And this could itself take months. This could itself take months. So those were, I mean, some of the challenges that they faced. Now, the independent Ghana starts from a set March 1957 to 30th June. 1960. Now, even before set March, there had been an election in um, 1954 where Kwame Kroma had been elected as the prime minister as at that time under the feathers or under the flag of the Convention People's Party and was the prime minister back then. So it was in set March 1957 that Ghana gained independence. Now we should understand that the independence that Ghana had essentially meant that Ghana from this time on could be responsible for its own affairs. It, it didn't mean that the country was free totally from the rulership of the queen in UK. It just meant that as at that point we were not a colony of the UK and that we were free and then responsible for ourselves. But we still had laws being um, made in UK that were still affecting us. So from 6th March 
1957 to 30th June was what was a time where were well, semi independent. In fact, in fact, we were semi independent because we we had not been fully detached from um, the the clause of our of our colonial masters. Indeed, as at that time we were never a colony of them, but I mean they they still exercise some powers. So the constitution as at that time was the Ghana constitution order in council 1957. So it was the Ghana independence act that stated that henceforth the gold coast is now free and then responsible to manage its own affairs. So the Ghana office of uh, governor general also gave the, the governor general the powers. And of course these powers were limited. They were limited, you know, to determine the affairs of the new country till there will be a final handover. Now the executive as at that time, as, as I mentioned earlier, the executive as at that time was still vested in the queen, you should understand. So even, even though we're independent in 1957, the executive power, the day-to-day -day running was in the queen. The queen did the day-to-day -day management. Then, of course, the queen was not in the UK. So these powers were exercised by the governor general. And the governor general as at that time was Sir Charles Aden Clark. He was the governor general as at that time. And of course, he was exercising a bit of a limited power. And as at that time, we had a prime minister and the prime minister was um, Kwame Nkrumah. So, the Kwame Nkoma was in charge of government, and then the Governor General was was exercising the powers on behalf of the Queen, who was the head of state. So we had a head of state, which is the Queen, and we had a head of government, which is Kwame Nkoma, the the Prime Minister, as at that time. So in that executive power, as was exhibited under the Independence Act, and then the Constitution that was promulgated. Um, there was to be a cabinet, and the cabinet was to be made up of members of not less than eight, and these members were to be elected members of um, parliament. But here, here, much of the power, as I say, was really under the prime minister and the governor general, even though the governor general had the power, or of course, the governor general appointed the prime minister, the state of affairs in respect to the day-to-day -day man management was mostly done by the prime minister. I mean, the governor general had a limited power. He was exercising on behalf of the queen, but when, when it, it comes to the ceremonial head, it was the queen. The ceremonial head was the queen, but on the grounds, it was the prime minister who was doing the actual work with the cabinet members. Here, the legislature was made up of a parliament. And the, if here, even the parliament was made up of the Queen and the National Assembly. As at that time, it was called the National Assembly. So, and of course, the powers of the Queen would definitely be exercised by the Governor General. And they were supposed to have not less than 104 elected members. Now, when it came to the judiciary, it was still the courts in the Gold Coast. And here, as at that time, um, the West African Court of Appeal had been abolished. Now, this is, is, really makes sense because as of 1957, Ghana had become independent. And the West African Court of Appeal was actually um, a court for all the colonies under the British government. So now that we were independent, it, it was not possible that an appeal from a court in Gold Coast should go to a colonial court of appeal court. Of course, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But of course, when it came to an appeal, so the final authority was the Privy Council, meaning that we still had to travel to UK if you want your, if you were dissatisfied with the courts and the courts of appeal as had been established in the Gold Coast, you had to 
go to the Privy Council in the UK. So that was um, essentially an independent Ghana. Now, between 1st July 1960 to 23rd February 1966 is what we call the First Republic. Or normally, so the constitution as at this time is what we call the Republican constitution. Now, when we say the Republican constitution or when we say the first republic, we are saying that it was at this time that truly Ghana became independent and was weaned totally off the colonial masters. So as at this time, Ghana, as was called, was in charge of the executive the judiciary and the legislature. So the queen had no powers and the governor general who was exercising this authority had no powers and all authority had been given to the new country Ghana to manage itself. So you should understand the difference between independent Ghana and then the Republic Ghana. For Republic Ghana, we were totally wind of our colonial master. For independent Ghana, we were not a colony of the UK, but however, they still exercised some you know, authority on us up until 1st July 1960, when we became totally um, free from them. And some of the relevant laws um, that we had there is the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana 1960 and its amendment in 1964. Now here, the executive was in the hands of the president and, and here the president was Kwame Nkrumah. So here, as is clearly stated here, the queen and the governor general had been displaced. So they were no longer holding power in Ghana. So the executive power was manned by the president. And as at that time, the, the president was Kwame Nkrumah. So Kwame Nkrumah was in charge of the army and, and, and really all, all affairs that were in relation to the executive was done by him. So the president did all the appointment of ministers, even cabinet it was still done by the president and he was to appoint not less than eight members to the, the cabinet. And the cabinet was really in charge of the general direction and control of the government. But the main man behind the affairs was Kwame Nkrumah. Now here, a very interesting um, provision that was included around the Republican era was that there was the establishment of the presidential commission. Now this commission was to be made up of three persons. Now the whole idea was that when the president was ill or the president had passed on, it was this committee that was to ensure the running of the state. Now for those who are um, knew a little about Ghana and, and, and its constitution, this issue actually came up some time past for the Supreme Court of Ghana to elaborate more because you now ask, it stands in our constitution. Where the president is not around, it is the vice president. Where the vice president is not around, to the speaker, to the speaker of parliament. Now where the speaker is not around, it is the chief justice. Now here, where the president, I understand that as at this point, um, we didn't have a vice president. So here, the provision was that if the president was not around, it, it was the presidential commission that was to take in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the state, not the vice president as we have now, or even not the speaker of, of parliament as is the, the case now. But you would understand as the Supreme Court has stated, the interpretation plays that where the president is not around is to the effect that, I mean, 
now that with um, technological advancement, the president may not necessarily be in the country, but then the president could still be you know, performing his duties even outside of the country. So yes, there will be a vice president, but I mean, that may not necessarily mean that the president is not around. Of course, physically he's not around, but he, may, he could still you know, perform um, his functions as a president. But even before you know, we migrated to that point where we had a vice president and that hierarchy came in, this was what we had. There was a presidential um, commission who was to take charge. Now here, the legislature was made up of the president and the National Assembly. And as I said, the National Assembly is what we now have as parliament. So it was made up of the speaker and then the elected members of parliament. But interestingly, as at this point, the president was part of parliament. Very interesting. The president was part of the parliament. And you can understand, if the president is part of parliament, I mean, as to how uh, members of parliament could really make laws without actually having in mind the president was, was, was um, really would be a matter of concern because if the president is part of you in parliament, it means that if you are making laws that does not go in favor of the president, you are to be minded because he is there. And it also meant that the president could also push laws which he felt were necessary. So that level of um, separation of powers <clears throat> as we have now um, was not present here. So this will also be one of the differences as existed uh, back then from what we have now. So it's possible you can even get a question that um, outline the differences between the previous constitution and the 1992 constitution. And this is one of the points we would expect you to point out. That in the Republican constitution, the president was part of the National Assembly. In the Republican constitution, the president was part of the National Assembly. Now here, under the judiciary, it was still vested in the court of Ghana. And as at this time, the Privy Council had been abolished. And of course, you would understand that because as at this time, we had been weaned totally from the, the colonial masters. So even back to the legislature, there were provisions to the effect that the president had the power to make laws which he felt was in the interest of national security. And it was out of this, you know, um, structure that we had the PD Act and it was, that is the Preventive Detention Act. So it was under that act that um, uh, more like opposition leaders in, in other parties who were opposing the, the government, some of whom were arrested, I mean, and whatnot. It was because the president was part of legislature and could make you know, um, certain laws. Well, we will not justify as to whether they are wrong or right, but we will have to understand that maybe the dispensation as at that time warranted um, the making of some of these laws. It is not in our place to determine the uh, propriety or otherwise of them. It is for our learning. So that going on in the future, we will know how. So this is one of the reasons why they thought, well, um, there ought to be separation of powers between the executive and then the legislature, but as at this time, the president was part of the legislature and was making laws. Then we had our first military takeover, and this was done by the National Liberation Council. Now I would uh, urge students to be mindful about the dates because the dates are very important and they can be very confusing. So students should actually put asterisks in their notes and make sure that they get the right dates. So for the National Liberation Council, it was around 24th February, 1966 to 21st August, 1969. Now, these are some of the um, relevant laws that was made as at that time. Now, around this time, the executive power was manned by General Joseph 
Atta Ankara. Oh. Lieutenant General Joseph Atta Ankara. So he was really the head of the National Liberation Council as at that time. And here, they, they, they had the executive council. So the leaders of the National Liberation Council established the executive council, which was made up of, of course, the, the military heads, which was headed by um, Lieutenant General Joseph Atta Ankara. They had the executive council. So it was the executive council that had the executive power and was exercising same on behalf of the country, which was Ghana. So they formed the, the government. So the legislature, they also made laws. It was, it was still, I mean, the legislature was still under the clause of the NLC, which is the National Liberation Council. So they made the decrease as at that time. These laws they made were called the decrees. They made the de decrees. So they were still in charge of parliament and they were the ones making uh, the laws for parliament. So as, as at this time, parliament would not really be in existence because I mean, it's a military takeover. So, but they were the ones in charge of the legislative arm of government. That is the making of the laws. They were the making, they were the ones, sorry, they were the ones making the laws. Now, when it came to the judiciary, most of the courts that had existed prior to this time were still uh, in force. And all judges who were holding their positions were still did say, but I mean, we, 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 we should also understand that, I mean, around these times, um, as to how independent these judges were, I mean, it's, it's a question for I mean, all of us to ask because I mean, under a military takeover, I mean, as a judge sitting in court, you, you are minded as to how you, know, you make certain verdicts, especially when it would affect um, the government in power. Well, we cannot go deep into that, but I mean, students can you know, think about it and just you know, um, discuss whether the uh, judiciary as at this time could be independent of the government in power, which was the National Liberation Council. Now, just after the National Liberation Council, Ghana resumed into a Republican state. So we came back to being a republic where we were ruled by a civil government. And that was the second republic. And that spanned around um, 22nd August 1969 to 12th January 1972. Now, under the second republic, the very popular figure we have here is um, Edward Ekufu Ado. Now he was the head of government and then the prime minister was Buzia. So Buzia was the prime minister and the head of government was um, Edward Ekufu Ado. Now, even before Edward Ekufu Ado, you see in other literatures making mention of one Ni Ama Olim, not a very popular figure. I think the most popular person here is Edward Ekufu Ado. So he was the head of government and then, um, no, the head of state was Edward Okufuad, and the prime minister who was in charge of the head of government was um, Buzia. So that was how it was, it was manned. So here, the president was the head of state and then the commander in chief, the president was the head of state. And then the prime minister was the head of cabinet and government, as I said earlier. So the prime minister was in charge of government. Now here, the difference between the two is that the head of state ordinarily appears to be a ceremonial position. Ceremonial in the sense that when we are having functions, uh, the one assuming to be in charge of the government would be the head of state. But when it came to the day-to-day -day running, day-to-day -day running of the state, it was always the head of, of government. So you would have the ceremonial head, which were deemed to be the president. But when it comes to the day to day, who actually takes the decision, it is always the, the, the prime minister. So here, the prime minister, which is Buzia, was in charge of the government and also the cabinet. Now, again, the cabinet was 
to be make up of no less than eight and not more than um, 17 ministers. And all these ministers were supposed to be appointed from the National Assembly, which is the parliament. And when it comes to the legislature, they had the power. So as at that time, we we're back to a civilian rule. So we had um, parliamentarians who made up the National Assembly. Then again, under the judiciary, we had all the courts. But here, the final court was the Court of Appeal. We didn't have the Supreme Court as at this time. Now, we were back to military rule again, which is uh, 13 January 1972 to 23rd September 1979. And we were under the rulership of the National Redemption Council. Now, the National Redemption Council was under the rulership of General Ignatius Kutu Echampo. And I'm sure. Um, most of you may have heard of the name Echampo. He, he was in charge of all, he was, I mean, the head of the National Redemption Council that took over power under the Second um, Republic. So he has seen the executive was manned by um, an executive council and the executive council was to be made up of members from the National um, Redemption Council. Now here they were supposed to have a, a chairman. So there will be a chairman of the executive you know, council. And they exercise the, the, the powers of government. Now here, the legislative power was also in the affairs of the National Redemption Council. So they were the ones making the law. So they were in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the state. And they, they were also the same guys making laws for the state. Now here, the courts that had existed were still the same, were still the, the same courts that were in play. Now, after the National Redemption Council, then we had the Supreme Military Council. Now, when you read other literature, they would tell you that it was the National Redemption Council that metamorphosed or changed into the Supreme Military Council one. So here, it was still General Ignatius Kutu Champon who was um, in charge of the Supreme Military Council one, it was the same. And I think here, it's uh, really essentially the same. There, there, there was really not much. It's still the same. There was to be a chairman So it's really, really the same. There's really not much of a difference. So here to say the laws, or the laws were made by the Supreme Military Council. Now here under the judiciary, the Supreme Court um, had been abolished and it was replaced by a full bench of the court for people. So here there was no Supreme Court. So the, the final arbiter was the court of the full bench of the court of appeal. Now, when we say the full bench, men normally a court of appeal is made up of three judges. So the full bench will be all the three judges sitting. So normally it's either a single bench and the single bench will just be one judge sitting or the full bench and the full bench will be all the three judges sitting. So that is it. Now, from Supreme Military Council one, we went into Supreme Military Council II. And under the Supreme Military Council II, it was Lieutenant General Fred Ekufu. He was in charge of the Supreme Military Council II. And they exercised the executive power. They exercised the executive power. And here, they appointed what we call the commissioners. So the executive power was under the hands of um, folks they termed as um, commissioners. So commissioners were appointed you know, to exercise power, more like ministers as we have now, and, but these guys were, were called commissioners. So they were in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the state as at this time. They also exercised um, legislative power and then 
it was saying the full bench of the court of appeal was, was the final court. So here, there was no Supreme Court. Same as a Supreme Military Council, what there's, there was no um, Supreme Court. Now from here, there was a military takeover by the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, by the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council. And the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council was manned by our very own Flight Lieutenant Jerry John Rollins. So Jerry John Rollins was in charge of the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council that took over power from the Supreme Military Council. So, I mean, just to move on with it, the executive was, the, was by the AFRC, the legislature was the AFRC, and the judiciary power was same as um, was in SMC2, which was the, fi the final bench was the full bench of the Court of Appeal, or the final arbiter was the full bench of the Court of Appeal. So here there was no um, Supreme Court too. And please, students are minded to take notice of the dates. The dates are very, very important. The students are to be minded of the dates. I would actually encourage students to, you know, just have a sheet of paper, um, National Liberation Council, they will put down the name, National Redemption Council, they will put down the name, Supreme Military Council, put, put it down, Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, put it down, then um, Second Republic, just, just do it that way so that you won't um, forget. So from here, we came back to Republican states and it is what we call the Third Republic. So under the Third Republic, it was headed by um, Hila Liman, and Hila Liman was from the People's National Party. So he was in charge, or he was the president of the Third Republic. Now, one notable feature I need students to take note is that under the Third Republic, the president was no more part of the legislature. So the parliamentary system of government had been shifted to what we call the executive system of government. So under the parliamentary system of government, the president was part as uh, um, we've all seen earlier, uh, or really under the time of uh, Kwame Nkrumah, the president was part of the legislature, but here there was a total separation. So um, the president was not, and was not answerable to parliament, really the president were, were never answering to parliament anyway, but in a proper parliamentary system, the president is supposed to be answerable to parliament, like in, in, in cases of um, UK and Italy, and really UK, the, the president or the prime minister, not necessarily the president, but the prime minister, the head of government is supposed to be answerable to the legislature. So here we had moved from the parliamentary system to the executive system. And under the executive, the president was not part of the legislature and was really not answerable, of course. I mean, um, they answerable, but not really answerable to the extent that um, parli uh, parliament had powers to you know, impose some sanctions on the president. Now, students are to also know that it was under the Third Republic that the position of the vice president was introduced. This is so very important. So as I keep on saying, you could have a question where they are asking you to distinguish between the past constitutions and the 1992 constitution. This is one of the um, things I need you to talk about. And even one thing I should have mentioned, under the 1960 constitution, we had what we call the one party state. So the one party state was that uh, we only had one party and that uh, no other entity could establish another party aside the one party that we have. I mean, of course, Kwame uh, Nkrumah may have had you know, his reasons around some of these things, but you, you know that under the 1992 constitution, it is, it is the Ghana can never have one party. That is why we have MPP, NDC, PNC, I mean, and, and, and a host of them. It is because now it is a multi-party system and not a single party system as, was done in 1960. So here we had the press, we had the vice president, so very important. It was in the third republic that we had the vice president. Also in the third republic, we deviated from the 
parliamentary system of government to the executive system of government. This is very, very important. And I want students to um, note that. So here, the legislature exercise a strict separation of powers. What this essentially means that um, whatever parliament did is what we call what is a closed book. A closed book means that um, you cannot interfere into the activities of parliament. So whatever is done in parliament stays in parliament. So the president could not determine laws that were being passed by parliament. No. So there was this strict you know, separation of powers between the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. So under the Third Republic, the Supreme Court was established. So then we had the High Court, Court of Appeal, and then the Supreme Court. But students are supposed to note, so very important, there was a strict separation of powers under the Third Republic, meaning that the president could not interfere in the activities of the legislature, and the leg legislature could also not interfere into the activities of the executive. Then again, the Supreme Court was reestablished. You will know that under um, SMC and then um, AFRC, it was up to the full bench of the Court of Appeal, but here it was reestablished. So there was a Supreme Court as at this time. Then we come to the very famous Provisional National Defense Council, which is the PNDC. And as we all know, the PNDC was headed by our, our very own Jerry John Rollins, who just departed from us. So he was in charge of the PNDC, and this was from 31st December 1981 to 1st January 1993. So here, the executive powers was manned by the PNDC, and they had a chairman, of which, of course, will be Papa J. And the um, same legislature, they were, they were the ones making, of course, I mean, in, in all the military regimes, it was, it's the executive that mans the activity of the legislature. So if you don't remember anything, just know that in all the military government, the powers of the executive and that of the legislature are the same because it is the same entities that is managing both. But for the judiciary, it's, it's really not the same. First, it was up to the Supreme Court, then it moved to the Court of Appeal, and now back to the Supreme Court. But you should also understand that under the PNDC, there was the establishment of what we call the public tribunal. And for those who are old enough to know, it was also called infamously the kangaroo court. I mean, of course, people complain that, I mean, there was no fairness in these uh, courts in that once you get there, you are not coming back. I mean, that is not our interest. Our interest is to know that aside the normal court, we also have the public tribunal court. I mean, normally this court, this, court, that is the public tribunal, normally dealt with cases of national interest. So um, you would have few who are, are, you know, aggrieved about this court because possibly their relatives or even themselves suffered at the hands of, of the judgments under this court. But what I need students to understand is that aside the normal court system, there was also the public tribunal court, which was administered by the the PNDC. I mean, you can read more about um, these things. So essentially, that is the history of Ghana's constitution as it is up to now. So with a very, very quick recap before we move to um, the second session, what am I saying here? This is what I'm saying. I'm saying that in order to better understand the constitution as we have now, it is imperative to understand what had happened in the past because what happened in the past affect or affected what happened afterwards and even presently and what would happen in the future. So the present occurrences would determine what the future constitution will be. So indeed, whatever is happening now, now that the NDC is contesting the election 
and they are in the Supreme Court. Whatever happens now will be a precedent for the future. So there may be novel situations that, that the Supreme Court may be dealing with now. And based on this novel situation, they may form or, or they may promulgate new CRs and allies and even amend portions of the constitution to cater for these current needs. So the constitution as we have now did not just come. It is on the basis of previous past constitutions and the happenings of you know, past events that warranted the need of a constitution of this nature. And I'm saying that in order to best understand this, you have to look at it from the pre-colonial era, come to the colonial era, and then the post-colonial era. Now I said that under the pre-colonial era, it was mainly under the ambit of the chiefs, the chiefs, the elders, who were really you know, managing day-to-day -day affairs. So when it came to the executive, it was really the chiefs and then the elders. When it came to legislature, it was the chiefs, elders, and these major you know, tribal heads who were making the laws. When it came to the judiciary, as in the interpretation of the laws, it was still the chiefs and mostly the elders. So for the pre-colonial era, the chiefs were in charge mainly. Now for the colonial era, we have the, the British government mainly you know, you know, taking care of affairs. And if you remember, I said that the Ghana that we have now was patched together out of four different constituents. So we had the original, the Gold Coast, Accra, sorry, Accra Central Region area there, which, was, um, the, which formed the Gold Coast colony. And I said that that one was done through settlement. Settlement, I mean that when the, when the British settlers came, they settled at the Gold Coast. When they settled there, through time, they decided in ruling them. And that was really under the illegal administration, which was later regularized under the bond of 1844. Then we have the Ashantis who became part of the Gold Coast through conquest, through conquest around 1901. Then we have the Northern Territories who became part of the Gold Coast because they wanted protection from their neighboring you know, um, countries and their neighboring towns and whatnot. Then we have the Togoland, or we call the you know, Trans-Togoland, which was really between um, Britain and then France. But initially that portion was under the rulership of German. So when German lost the war, and then it was now given to Britain and then France. So when Britain was about leaving Ghana or when Ghana sought independence by the help of uh, Mensa Saba and, and all the other guys, Kwame Nkuma, all the other fantastic guys, who fought for the liberation of Ghana. Out of all this, the British decided that they wanted to leave us. So in leaving us, they had to decide for us whether those around Volta region or T region as we have now, and even Togo as and then, whether they wanted to be part of Ghana or they wanted to be part of Togo. For those who agreed to be part of Ghana, they formed what we call, uh, now called the Volta region and then the parts of Volta region. And for those who decided not to be part of Ghana, they from Togo as well. And I said that this was done through what we call the pledge, a plebiscite, a yes or no vote plebiscite. Then we come to the post-colonial, which began with the independence constitution. We have the first republic, and then the military governments coming in, second republic, third republic, military governments coming in. And now we are in the fourth re republic. Fourth Republic. Please know that we are still in the Fourth Republic. Although governments have changed, we are still in the Fourth Re Republic. So the constitution we are using is still the Fourth Republic constitution. Now, if you have any question in respect of the first session, please do well, just send them to me. I will do well to answer them for you. Good. Now, session two. Under this session, we would want to understand what is constitution and constitutional law? Now I know that I've been talking about the history of Ghana's constitution and whatnot, but it's possible uh, most of you folks don't understand what a constitution is and what is constitutional law. Of course, this course is constitutional law. So what the heck is a constitutional law? Now let's now um, tackle what 
constitution is and what the um, constitutional law is, just to put everything into perspective. Now, when we talk about constitutional law, I need students to understand that there are two definitions of a constitution. We have the broader definition of a constitution and we have the narrow definition of a constitution. I can bet most students know of the narrow definition, but not so much about the broader definition. Now, when we talk about the narrow definition of the constitution, we are saying that it is the constitution as we know that exists in a book or in a document. So the 1992 constitution exists in a book, which is just one document. So where the constitution exists in a book or the content in that book would be the constitution of the country. So here we will see that the constitution of Ghana is in the 1992 constitution or the book we call the 1992 constitution. That is, that is really a narrow way to define constitution to say that a constitution is, is a book that contains all the laws that govern the state. Because most of them are not, even though the laws in itself may exist in a book, there are other usages, conventions, practices that may not be in the, in the books. But then govern the people because we, want, we would understand that in most of the rural areas, most folks may not be aware that there, there is even a document called the 1902 Constitution that governs them. No, they don't. They don't. All that they know will be the laws that have been passed by the chiefs. I hope you understand. So in, in a very rural area, they won't know about the 1902 Constitution. They wouldn't. You'll be surprised that um, some may not even know who the vice president is. They may not even know who the chief justice is. They may not even know who the speaker of parliament is. They are so remote so much that all that they care is just about themselves, their family, and, and, and really their community. They, they, they really don't have much to do with the bigger governance because, well, this may be out of you know, so many reasons. We don't want to go there. But for such folks, defining a constitution to just mean a document may mean that they are not governed because, of course, I mean, whatever governs them is not the book because they don't know about the book even to be, you know, to begin with. So for folks like that, it will be the practices, it will be the usages, it will be the conventions, it will be the bylaws that have been made by the chief that governs them. So in order for us to better understand what a constitution is, we, are, we would have to look at it from both the broader view and the narrow view. So the broader view would say that the constitution would include all the body of laws, the principles, the practices, the usages, conventions that relate to the system of government. And understand that when we say the system of government, it may not necessarily be the central government. We are looking at the regional government and even the district government, and even at time to an extension, the chiefs, because the, in these rural areas, it is the chief that is the government there. So it is the laws that have been made by these chiefs that bind them, you understand? So whenever you are defining a constitution, don't ever say that uh, the constitution is that document that contains you know, the laws that govern us. You may not be too wrong, too right, but then again, you should also go ahead and say that it also includes the usages, the passages, sorry, the practices, the principles, the conventions that form the system of government. So to get a better definition of a constitution, that is how you say it. So assuming you get a question saying, what is a constitution? The excellent student will say that there isn't one definition of a constitution. This is because the definition of a constitution could be looked from the narrow view and then the broader view. The narrow view, then you explain. The broader view, then you explain. I hope, I hope this point is clear. Now this is, um, normally you would hear a statement that UK is without a constitution because UK doesn't have one single document as we have, they don't. So what they have um, is really many laws, many laws they've made that really don't have a central point like Ghana where we have one constitution and all other laws 
must derive the authority from from uk it's just you know a mix of laws they just make and they don't have one central so normally they say that they don't have a constitution but if you look at it critically they do have a constitution because this constitution will be the practices will be the conventions, the usages the rules as is applicable there so of course the fact that they don't have a single document does not mean they don't have a constitution i, I hope you get it yeah so, and assuming you get the question that UK is a country without constitution, do you agree? Well, in a way I agree, in a way I disagree. They are without a constitution because they don't have a single document, but they have a, a constitution because they have many, they have, you know, uh, many laws, they have many practices, many rules, Laws that are in you know different, different, different books, and not necessarily in a in a single book, as um, would expect of you know a constitution. So yes, in a way, they may not have a constitution because their laws is not in a single book, but they have a constitution because their laws are spread out in many books, and it is out of practice, it is out of the rules, it's out of the convention that they are ruled as a country. Now, of course, here you would you would also see other writers, you know, criticizing the UK, claiming that they have a constitution by under the use of the broader um, definition. Because I mean, the argument is that before and before you will see, before we talk about the letter and spirit of the constitution, some will say that if we don't have the letter of the constitution, what is the single book, we cannot have the spirit, because the spirit is supposed to derive its uh, authenticity from the letter of the constitution. So, I mean, there are a whole lot of arguments there, but I mean, for your, um, for your understanding and for the purposes of this like, uh, tutorial, let me say, I want us all to understand that almost every country has a constitution. It may not necessarily be a single document which will fall under the um, narrow definition or mostly it may fall under the broader definition, which may be the practices, the usages, the conventions, the rules that have been applied in that um, area. So for Ghana, normally um, we take solace from the dictum of uh, SOA JSC in the very popular case of to four versus attorney general, because it is in this case that um, he sought to explain the broader definition of a constitution. And according to SOA JSC, he says that the constitution has a letter, has its letter of the law. So the letter of the law is the document itself. And he said that equally, the constitution has its spirit. Now the spirit really is the interpretation that is put on the letter. So you would understand that where there are confusions as to the meanings of um, provisions in the constitution, the law mandates that these matters should be brought to the Supreme Court. So then the Supreme Court will try to interpret what the framers of the constitution meant when they made that law. So by their interpretation, then we get what we call the spirit of the constitution. So there's the letter, which is the document itself, and there's the spirit which is the interpretations that are put on the document itself. And according to um, JSC SOA, I mean, he says that um, it is the fountainhead of the authority. So it means that all the authority of government being exercised must and emanates from the constitution. So the authority of the executive, the authority of the judiciary, the authority of the legislature all emanate from the constitution. So without the constitution, the executive can't do anything. Without the constitution, the legislature or the judiciary cannot do anything. They all derive their power from the constitution. So you see how important the, the, the constitution is. So your, your understanding of the constitution will help you better know how governments function. You better would help you know how ministers are appointed, will help you know how judges are appointed, will help you know how you know, heads of the you know, uh, regions and whatnot, the ministers of the various regions are appointed, even how the demarcations in the um, constituents, the demarcations in the regions and whatnot are done. 
once you understand the constitution, you get to know the powers that have been arrogated to the president in respect of the demarcations of the country into regions. Now, another very important point, which um, SOA JSC did, which I would want to bring to your attention is that it says that the constitution is capable of growth, meaning that the constitution is not stagnant, the constitution grows. So as and when the occurrences happen, the constitution would have to adapt and grow with it. So according to him, the constitution is always growing. And mind you, this growth is always under the backdrop of the spirit of the constitution, because by interpreting the constitution, we are adding more to it. Now be minded that these additions may not necessarily be additions into the single document. It may just be what we call the subsidiary laws or the delegated you know, legislations. These are laws that necessarily don't come from the constitution, but the constitution has just given a group of people the power to make laws. So um, the constitution can give a power to um, the DC to make bylaws. So even though the bylaws are not linked to the constitution, the bylaws are only existing because the constitution appoints the DC and allows the DC to make the, the bylaws. I hope you, you, you get it. So it is out of the spirit, it's out of the interpretation and the need for some of these laws that the constitution goes, or according to a SOA JSC is capable of good. And, and to him, he feels that the, the constitution is a living organism and can grow. And then I agree with him. I agree with him. Now, um, out of the two definitions that um, I have conversed earlier, from it, we get to understand a fair idea of what the nature of the constitutions or, or here, what would be the basic characteristics of a constitution? So what are the things we should see if we want to know whether um, whatever is being done there uh, has the semblances of a constitution? Now we are saying that the constitution is the product of the constituents. And the word constituents really would um, derive from the constituency. And you know that most, or, more, or not even most, all constituencies are headed by, not necessarily headed by, but all constituencies are allowed to appoint a member of parliament. So it is these member of parliament who at the end of the day would make the laws. So the constitution as we have in Ghana, it went through the drafters and then it went through parliament and it was, accepted. So every constitution will be the product of the constituents or the members of parliament who are representing the constituency where they come from. So even though it is the members of parliament who will be making laws for us, the assumption is that it is the constituents who have appointed the member of parliament who stands in for them. I hope that point is clear. And also the constitution establishes states institutions and then uh, divisions and agencies of government. So uh, as I said, the executive, the executive is established in the constitution. So is the legislature, so is the judiciary. So there can't be a parliament without the uh, constitution establishing it. Now really it, now the, the, the challenge is that even though it is parliament that is passing the constitution, the constitution also legitimizes the existence of parliament. So for always, for the very first uh, constitution, it is always dicey, I understand. For always for the very first constitution, it's always you know, quite interesting because the powers of parliament will be derived from the constitution. However, it will be parliament that would have to you know, pass the constitution. So for always the very first one, it's always a, a very interesting and then a tricky one. And also here, almost all the sources of power exercised by all agents of government are from parliament or are from, sorry, are from the constitution or an agency established under the um, constitution. How these points are clear. So the organization, the distributions of uh, functions of powers, the rights and duties of people, they are all established in the constitution or an authority established under the constitution. 
and the constitution also makes you know room for changes and then amendments all these are in the constitution now we move on to a very um, important uh, point which is um, the classifications of a constitution now even before you get confused what i need you to or what i need students to understand is that when we are talking about the classifications of constitution we are not saying that um every country has one of these classifications. In fact, what happens is that it is mostly a blend of one or more of these you know, types of constitutions. So you can get just one constitution being flexible, being Republican, being a, a, a parliamentary executive and whatnot. So it, it is not the case that you would have one constitution just being uh, rigid. So let's say Ghana is rigid, Nigeria is flexible, USA is monarchical. No, no, that's not what we are saying. Here we are just saying that you can have one constitution, but the constitution will be having the classifications of a number of um, the types of constitutions that we have. Now, the very first one we'll be dealing with is the rigid or the flexible type of constitution. Now, when we say a constitution is rigid or flexible, we are actually talking about the amendment procedures in that constitution. Students should note that whether a constitution is rigid or flexible is dependent on the amendment procedures in that constitution. So that if it is easy to amend that constitution, then it means that that constitution is a flexible constitution. If it is rigid to amend that constitution, then it means that it is rigid. I hope a student gets this point. Now for Ghana, we have um, both entrenched provisions and then non-entrenched provisions. So Ghana, I mean, our situation is not really like we are rigid or flexible because there are certain uh, provisions in our constitutions that are very, very rigid, meaning that it will be difficult for it to be amended. And then there are a few provisions in there that are very flexible, meaning that it is you know, quite easy to you know, amend. So that is what we mean. And that rigid and flexible, we are talking about the amendment procedure. How, how easy it is to amend it, or how difficult is it to amend it? I hope that point is clear. Now, the next bit is the monarchical or the Republican type of constitution. So here, what we want to understand is that who becomes the head of state of that country? Or how does the constitution define who the head of state is? Now, in a monarchical type of constitution, it would really be a monarchy. So it's a person who is not elected, like UK. The queen is not elected. And if um, she passes on whoever comes, may not be elected by the people. Definitely these guys are elected or are appointed from the royal family. So now it is clear that if the queen is no more, um, we all know who would uh, succeed her. So th that is a monarchical type of constitution. The person in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the state is not elected by a popular election. It is really a person who is appointed from the royal family. Indeed, I mean, the monarchical type is becoming ceremonial. It's becoming ceremonial because, I mean, UK appears to have a monarchical type because they still have their queen in charge, even in Spain. They are all monarchical in the sense that even though um, they may have these uh, kings and queens, they, they are ceremonial, they don't do much. They don't do much. And the government really runs without um, much of their influence or input as it used to be, as it used to be. Now, then we talk about the Republican, the Republican constitution. Now, under the Republican constitution, we are talking about an election in a popular, um, election of a president in a popular election like we just had um, some weeks ago appointing the president. So here under the Republican, 
there is the appointment of a president through an election. But under the monarchical, it is really an ascension of power by a person being appointed from a royal family. I mean, such persons are not really elected on. They are just you know, appointed or they, they know that once the, the head of state or the queen or the king passes on, they, they just know who would you know, succeed that, that person. So I hope this point is also clear. Then we talk about the presidential or the parliamentary type of government. So here, we just want to understand um, the system of government as it relates to the executive and then the legislature. I have, I have mentioned this earlier. Now with the parliamentary type of constitution, the executive is directly answerable to the legislature, meaning that whatever the executive does, he or she has to answer to the legislature and the legislature has the power to dismiss or remove such a person. So here we can talk of um, UK now, we have uh, Boris Johnson in charge. Michelle it was a female and um, the, the UK parliament uh, war, they, I mean, they, they always have the power to determine. So they, now we have uh, Boris Johnson who is the head of the party with majority in power. And he is now the, in charge of government manning the affairs of UK. So here, Boris Johnson is answerable to parliament, meaning that whatever he does, he must go through parliament to ensure that it is done. He cannot on his own, you know, make laws that affect, you know, the, the country. So that is the parliamentary system. Now, when it comes to the presidential system, it will just be the opposite where the president is appointed, is, sorry, is elected through an election and it's not answerable to parliament. And that we can talk about Ghana as we just did. We just elected the president, although it's, it's been challenging, we, we wait to see what would happen. But the president here is not answerable to parliament. I mean, he's only answerable to the people after four years. Then after four years, we'll determine whether uh, we would want another person or we'll change government, whatever the case may be. So here, we just want to understand the relationship between the executive and then the legislature. Whether the executive is answerable to the legislature or they are separate. If the executive is answerable to the legislature, then it is a parliamentary system. If the executive is not answerable to the legislature, then it is a, a presidential system. If the, um, the person being appointed is the head of parliament then is a parliamentary. But if the person being appointed was appointed through an election and not just being the head of um, the party with the majority in parliament, then it is presidential. I hope um, this classification is also clear enough. Then we can talk of the unitary and then the federal system of government. Now, under the unitary and then the federal system of government, sorry, under the unitary and then the federal system of government, we just want to understand the classifications as based on the division of power. So where is power being exercised? Is power centralized or is it shared? Now, where power is centralized at a point, then it means it is a unitary system of government. But where power is shared among federal states, then it is a federal system of government. Now, once I mention the word federal, definitely you should be thinking about um, USA, Nigeria, where Nigeria, they have their own federal states. So they have their states. In, in USA, they also have their states where we, we have the government in charge, but there are also federal states who have also appointed government, the governors also manning the affairs of that state. But where the power is really centralized, then it, is, it becomes a unitary type of government rather than federal. 
Now, the appointment of regional ministers does not really you know, make them um, federal of a sort because the ministers would still be appointed by the president. But under the federal system, the governors are also voted on. So um, that is how uh, it is. So I hope this one is also clear. Then we talk about the single party state and then the multi-party state. As I mentioned earlier, um, there was an amendment to the 1960 constitution by Kwame Nkrumah making Ghana a one-party state around uh, 1964 to 1966. I'm sure Kwame Nkrumah may have had his reasons. I mean, I would not go into there, but a single party state essentially means that there is only one party in operation in the state. So it's either you are with that party or not, but in a multi-party state, um, folks are allowed to form their own parties. And now Ghana, uh, under the 1992 constitution, uh, we are under a multi-party state. So as I mentioned, there's the MPP, there's the NDC, there's DPP, PNC, yes, and, and all the other um, fantastic political parties. So that is that um, under the single party state. So if you, you've been paying attention, you would realize that even taking Ghana, our, um, we fall under the multi-party because we also fall under the presidential. Our constitution is a bit rigid, flexible. We are a Republican. And then under the unicameral and then also the bicameral system, Ghana will be a unicameral system because we only have one chamber. We don't have um, two chambers as um, it is in um, UK, where they, they, they have the, you know, the upper chamber and then the lower chamber. Here, it's in Ghana, it's just one chamber. So in parliament, we just have one, just members of parliament. We don't have the lower chamber and then the upper chamber. Of course, in our system, we may have the majority in power and then the minority in power, but it doesn't denote that it is a bicameral system. It is still a unicameral system, just one parliament, but in other states, it is two, where we have the lower chamber and then the upper chamber. Then we will also come to, I think finally, we would come to the written and unwritten uh, constitution. Now, I'm sure by this, by now, you should know what is the written and then unwritten constitution. Now, when we say the written constitution, essentially would fall under the narrow definition of the constitution, where here we are saying that the constitution has been reduced into a document. So if the constitution is reduced into a document, it becomes a written constitution. If the constitution has not been reduced into you know, one document, then it becomes an unwritten constitution. So, but I'm saying that here, it, there's really no country that says that I am, or I fall under a written constitution and another saying that I fall under an unwritten constitution because most countries, you know, do have a blend of both. So you, are, you have a bit of a written and then a bit of a unwritten constitution. So in just one country, the constitution could be written, it could be unicameral, it could be multi-party, it could be presidential, it could be rigid, it could be a monarchical or republican. So just the constitution of a country may have the semblances of all these you know, uh, classifications of constitutions. I hope you, you understand. And if any of the points were not clear, please feel free, just um, put your question down. I will do well to answer it for you. Now, one, once that we understand what a constitution is, we would now try to understand what is constitutional law. What is constitutional law? Because the course which um, you are taking this semester is 
constitutional law. Constitutional law. So what is constitutional law? Now, generally, when we talk about constitutional law, we'll be looking at um, the laws that governmental agencies exercise their powers through. So what are the laws or what are the systems or what are the procedures that allow governmental agencies to exercise the power that has been afforded them? So we'd want to understand the, the principles by which you know, the authority of government is you know, exercised. So here we are looking at the laws, the rules, the practices, the relationship between the states and, and, and other actors, um, um, stakeholders, how they relate to the state. It all these fall under the ambit of con the um, constitutional law or fall under the ambit of the constitution and in the essence, the constitutional law. So here we would want to understand how does the executive exercise its powers, how does the legislature exercise its powers, how does the judiciary exercise its powers. All these are concerned or should be con the concern for um, constitutional law students because how these powers are exercised will determine how government is run. Because the, the powers of government are exercised by these agencies. So how they do it should be the interest of any um, constitutional law student. So we just want to, under constitutional law, we want to understand how these powers are interplayed, how these uh, powers are in, in exercised. Sorry, how these powers are exercised by these um, various agencies of government. So here there is, um, I think this definition uh, has been quoted earlier. This definition has been quoted earlier. So I think, um, I don't know if we have time to go into section three, but I mean, I would want to end that session to just know how um, students understood it and possibly if there is a way I could, um, Maybe changes going from maybe I was too fast, too slow. So um, all those um, comments would be would be welcome. So in in doing a very quick recap of all that I'm saying, now I, I am assuming you want a summary of everything. This is a constitutional law course. The whole essence of this course is to help the student better understand how governmental agencies exercise the powers that have been afforded them. We just want to know who the agencies of government are, how they derive their powers, and how these powers are um, enforced. And what we going forward would even you know, come to understand what can be done to ensure that these powers are not abused, whether they are exercising these powers within the remit as has been allowed them. These are very, very, very key points. Now, in trying to do this, we would have to first understand our past or our history, because by first understanding our history, then we would know how you know, um, the constitutions of the past government have affected the constitution as we have now. So the past constitutions would let us know why the, the, the present constitution is the way it is and going forward, what can be done about it. And I cannot emphasize the point that we used to have, or there would always be the pre-colonial era would have the colonial era, and then we'll have the post-colonial era. Now, when we talk about the pre-colonial era, we just use the word colonial just to mean that before the advent of the British to the Gold Coast. So before the British came to the Gold Coast, how was the constitutional environment like back then? And as we have gone through, 
we realized that the constitutional background as it was then was really in the hands of the chiefs. The chiefs you know, were managing the affairs as at then. So the chiefs with the elders, you know, with the major tribal heads, and, I mean, where family heads were determining powers under the executive, they were the same person determining you know, the, the laws that were made under the legislature. And then they were the same persons interpreting the laws. So that was the constitutional environment under the pre-colonial era. Now, now in the colonial era, we just want to understand how the constitutional environment was when we had the, the British taking over the Gold Coast. And I'm saying that before you understand that era, you would have to also understand that the constitutional environment back then did not just begin by the British just taking over the Gold Coast as it was then. Initially started through trading, through merchants, and then they started exercising their laws and then most of the folks back then realized that their laws were more efficient than that of the, of the chiefs. So they started taking matters there and that was when the British started exercising you know, power, quote and unquote, illegally. Then it got to a point where the chiefs were not very happy. So they sent um, a convoy to UK to, you know, uh, complain through a petition. Then that led to the bond of 1844, which, you know, has been stated in history as a point where the Gold Coast lost its um, powers and dominance to the British um, merchants back then, because it was at that point where the British you know, government sought to regularize its activities through the governors that were at the Gold Coast as at that time. You would also understand that the Gold Coast, which was around Accra and um, parts of Central Region, was just one. Before, through conquest, the Ashanti region, oh no, sorry, the Ashanti Kingdom, really, the Ashanti Kingdom was made part of the Gold Coast. Then through protection, the Northern Territories was made part of the Gold Coast. Then through a vote of what we call the plebiscite, the um, Togoland was made part of the Gold Coast. So that became the full circle of the Gold Coast. And then in 1957, we had our independence, meaning that we're no more under the colonial government. So even though we're no more under the colonial government, the queen was still the ceremonial head of state, even though Kwame Nkrumah was in charge of most of the affairs. So probably it was in 1st July, 1960 that we had a republic when we actually became free of the, the, the powers of our colonial masters. Now we've already gone through that. Um, I would not want to you know, be a belabor the point. So through the first republic, then we come to our military regimes and whatnot, um, coming to the 1992 um, constitution. Now it's possible you can get a question. Outlining the distinct features between the past constitutions and then the 1992 constitution. And I remember um, as I was talking, I highlighted on um, some of them. In your readings, you may come across you know, um, some of these points. I would endeavor that you make note of some of these things. Now from there, we come to try to understand what is even a constitution. What is this constitution that um, I've been talking about all this while. And I'm saying that to better understand the constitution, you would have to look at it from the two legs, the broader definition and the narrow definition. With the narrow definition, we are just looking at, at a text or at a document. With the broader definition, we are just looking at the rules, the usages, the practices, the conventions that have been at play in an area. So it may not necessarily be the document, but they may have their own bylaws. They may have their own rules that compliance are ensured among them. So when you put these two definitions together, then you, bet, you better understand you know, what a constitution is. Now here, I, I talked about uh, SOAS 
classic definition of what a constitution is. It's, it's possible you may have a question where they would quote um, uh, so as dictum, and then they would ask you to discuss what is a constitution. So it could be a uh, SOA JSC in the case of Tufo and Attorney General define the constitution that the constitution has its letter of the law, equally the constitution has its spirit Discuss. How do you answer this question? Really, you answer this question by first giving a general idea of what the constitution is, talk about the broader definition, talk about the narrow definition. Then you can come and you know, have a look at this and then try to you know, dissect it. I mentioned that when you talk about the letter, you are really talking about the document itself. When we talk about the spirit, you are talking about the interpretations that have been put on. I also mentioned that so I believe that the constitution was a living organism that was worthy of growth. So according to SOA, the constitution could grow. So you can also um, mention that. Now here are some of the characteristics of constitution. I would not want to belabor the point. It is really quite clear. And then I did go through the classifications of what is a constitution. So then again, let me reemphasize the point that in one constitution, you would have a majority of this classification in that in one constitution, it could be flexible, it could be monarchical, it could be presidential, it could be unitary, it could be single party, it could be bicameral, all written, all in one constitution. So it would be false for you to assume that in one constitution, we would only see unicameral and not multi-party, no, it's not true. One constitution could have the semblances of all of this. And, and for Ghana, we can go through for Ghana. For Ghana, yes, it's a bit flexible, it's a bit rigid because as I said, um, the amendment procedures in our constitution are both entrenched and non-entrenched. Entrenched means that for some, I mean, it would need a majority in parliament to enforce it or to make that change. But for others, I mean, not so much the case, especially for the, the, the not serious provision, but for the very serious provisions, you would need you know, um, a serious majority in parliament for that to be done. So for Ghana, it's really both rigid and inflexible. It's not really one. For Ghana, it's clear we are monarchic. Sorry, we are Republican. We've never been monarchic. Well, we can say that around that time where I mean, we had the queen, but even with that, um, was really under colonial rule, not necessarily um, monarchical. But for now, we are truly a Republican um, state. Then we can look at this. Ghana is a presidential. Indeed, at a point in time, we used to be um, parliamentary, but even our parliamentary system was different. Really, our parliamentary system was different in that even though Kwame Nkrumah was part of the legislature, it was not the case that he was answerable to them because he also exercised the majority of the, power, of the powers in, um, in parliament. So that bit is, is really different from um, the parliamentary system as we have here. Because the classical parliamentary system, the executive is answerable to the legislature as we have now in um, UK. Now, Ghana is a, is a unitary system. It's not really, it's not a federal. Federal will be talking about Nigeria. So Ghana is a unitary. Now, Ghana is a multi-party state. At a point in time, it was a single party state, but now we are multi-party state. Ghana is um, it's a unicamera, not bicamera. Nigeria, no, UK is bicamera, but Ghana is a unicamera, meaning that you only have one chamber. Now, when it comes to written and unwritten, yes, we have a written constitution, but in the same way, we also have a written constitution. So it's really you know, a mixture of both, not just one. So you can just take a country and then you know, pass it through and see whether uh, it falls under all of them or some of them or which, which of them it does you know, fall under. It's true, I will, I've explained what um, a constitution is or sorry, what I mean, constitutional law is. We just want, want to understand, I mean, the general framework of the agencies of government in the exercise of the authority, which have been allowed them under the constitution. So essentially that is a um, constitutional law. Um, 
I would be ending the tutorial very soon. I hope um, I have been able to explain uh, matters to your understanding. If um, by any chance there's any portion that was not very clear to you, I would um, please endeavor that um, just make the question available and I will do my very best to answer them. For today, uh, maybe in the course of the week, I'll, I'll send you guys an assignment or a question for you, you to try on just to make sure that you are reading and then you also understand what I've been talking about. I would also kindly uh, urge on you to read ahead at least for the next um, three sessions. So at least read on the sources of law in Ghana. Um, you can also read on standing and enforcement of the constitution. So it's really very simple, not, not difficult to understand at all. And then, um, okay, yes. So these two, these two will be enough. These two will be enough. But if you have the second lecture, I think I have no opinion, it's not available here. But if you have the fifth lecture, please just look at it, just scan through, just read it, be confused, no problem. When we start, I will do my very best to explain it and then we would, we would all make progress. And that is my honest hope that we we'll understand it and then also make good grace um, at the end of it all. So um, thank you very much and then see you in the next lecture. Have a good day. Bye-bye.